Harvard Divinity School. Uses and abuses of power in alternative spiritualities. Implications for spiritual care of patients and communities. April 27, 2023. What is Shakerism? So it's founded in England. A woman, Anna Lee, she's a working class woman, comes to Boston or to New York City in 1774. And she bring with her a new message of the Christ spirit returned. Uh, people recognize it as coming through her. And so the church that she establishes, they view as the reconstituted church of Christ on earth. The millennium has commenced. The Shakers believe God is by me, male and female. Uh, as I said, they recognize Mother Anne as the female vessel of Christ. They believe that celibacy is the root for mankind to return to the state of Adam before the fall. They have community of goods. They confess their sins and they're pacifist. So that in a nutshell is who the Shakers were. Now, I just published a biography of this man, Richard McNamara. Um, he it becomes one of the most important Shakers in the expansion of the movement west of the Appalachians following 1805. McNamara is born in 1770 in Pennsylvania on the frontier. Um, as a child, of course, the Revolutionary War is going on in that vicinity. Lots of conflict between indigenous people, uh, the British army, and of course the rebels. His family moves around a lot. He gets training as a, a weaver, a singing master, um, also teaches school for a while. Eventually he undergoes religious conversion and becomes a Presbyterian minister. Um, McNamara, is one of the key players eventually in what's known as the Kentucky Revival. This is uh, part of the Second Great Awakening. It begins in 1798 in South Central Kentucky. And by 1801, we have the massive revivals at Cambridge. Uh, and he's one of the, the pivotal ministers. And here we see a view there of one of these tent meetings. These were like giant outdoor festivals that were held. Frontier people would come from all around and camp on the ground and listen to preachers of many different denominations. This is the Cambridge Meeting House itself, uh, which is now a national monument. There's a building around this original log church to protect it. And this is where McNamara saw some of his greatest um, oratorical heights and was recognized by his peers as one of the most important preachers. Pivotally though, in 1805, the Shakers sent missionaries from New Lebanon, New York to bring this new gospel out to the West. They, they journeyed on foot over three months and they went directly to Richard McNamara's door at Turtle Creek, Ohio. Over the course of a month, they converted him to their gospel. And this is an actual drawing of his cabin with an outbuilding and a little shelter lean to that they erected. So the Shakers should practice their worship in dance, which is why we call them Shakers. This is their most outwardly defined characteristic. They dance in worship. McNamara became a leader for the Western Shakers. Um, and over the next 10 years, he performed missionary activity all over the Ohio River Valley. He even published the sect's largest publication to date, the Kentucky Revival, which is a history of the movement by one who was now deemed a heretic by those that he preached with because of his conversion to Shakerism. And it's an apologetic for the introduction of Shakerism among those people. McNamara served a mission to the Shawnee Indians. This is Tanspatawa, or the open door. What's remarkable about the Shakers' missionary activities, they took the theology and beliefs of the Shawnee at face value. They didn't look at them uh, derisively. Secretly, yes, they were hoping to make them Christians, but they were also interested to know what these people believed. So that's a remarkable uh, thing that he undertook. By the late 18-teens, McNamara had risen so high in the ranks of the Shakers that he was given a new name, Eliezer, which comes from the Bible. This is a nephew of, uh, or son of Aaron and a nephew of Moses. And we believe that this pseudonym uh, positions him, so to speak, as a nephew of Father David Darrow, who was the chief male elder of all the Shakers west of the Appalachians. So this, this guy was at the right hand of power, and he was used by the Shakers' own definition as a Minuteman for the gospel. They sent him to courts to testify and defend the Shakers. They sent him to legislatures. They had him write publications for them. And as I noted, they used him as a missionary. Now, because of this, they kept him off the rolls of the Shaker Covenant. This is the legal trust that binds this community together. And by keeping him uncovenanted, 
he is not a legal party to the Shakers. So therefore he can be a disinterested witness in court. Now this might seem like a great thing uh, for the Shakers, but in the end it sowed the seeds of McNamara's downfall. He also had become so powerful that he was able to directly communicate with the leaders among the Eastern Shaker communities. Shakerism is a theocracy. It's a hierarchy, it relies on divine revelation, um, and it's really, in, in a way, a despotic system. And for him as an uncovenanted member to be corresponding outside of the purview of his immediate elders with these leaders placed him in a very dangerous position in the long run. In 1825, the leader of the Western Shakers, Father David Darrow, died. This left a void. Uh, Darrow did not appoint a successor, although in a, a spiritual hierarchy as the Shakers, this was really incumbent on him to do, but he died saying there is no judgment. These Western communities were left in chaos in the wake of his death, and McNamara was more exposed than ever. This is Union Village um, in uh, about 1825. Uh, this is the view of where Richard McNamara lived. You can see the center of the village here. Uh, well, the meeting house, all the other communal workshops and buildings. So the Shakers were wealthy here, but in this leadership void, they suffered uh, the defalcation of one of their trustees. The trustees were the ones who controlled all the land assets and uh, all goods of this uh, communal society. And this was the third such defalcation by a trustee. This is the trustee's office at Union Village Shaker community. This one by trustee Nathan Sharp made national news. It was all over the newspapers. And they made fun of the Shakers saying that one of the brothers had left with as much as $100,000 leaving the brothers and sisters buzzing about like a swarm of bees who have lost their queen. Poor fellows, they found the truth of Burns' remark, mankind are once weak and little to be trusted. And so this was the final straw for the Eastern leadership. They sent a new leader to the West, a man named Freegift Wells. And Wells' job was to figure out what in the heck was going on in these Western communities and bring them into order. So this is a, a map of the Western Shaker communities uh, right about the time Free Gift Wells came in 1836. You can see they stretch from near Cleveland, Ohio, in the southwestern Ohio, two down in Kentucky. The one out in Indiana had closed in 1827. They were still dealing with fallout from that uh, catastrophe. So when Free Gift Wells arrived, he assembled the believers in the meeting house here at Union Village. He told them that a new order would be instilled. Privately, he began to meet with some of the most important members, including Richard McNamara. McNamara, who had settled into somewhat of a more uh, sedentary life at Union Village, was told he had to give up his work as the church scribe, turn over his printing press. He was printing religious tracts for the Shakers and uh, essentially stepped down from his leadership roles. Meanwhile, in the East, a new era had broken out of spiritual activity, which involved young spirit mediums receiving direct revelation from the spirit world. And the work that was going on in these communities was one of purging and refining. And this was exactly what Free Gift Wells used as a weapon in the Western Shaker communities. Now this revival began in August of 1837 in the East, but it took over a year until August of 1838 for the believers at Union Village to receive these, these manifestations of the spirit. Um, Richard McNamara was the target of these revelations and the Eastern ministry pressed Wells to know if he and his other old time Shaker converts were receiving these manifestations and participating in them, or if they were standing at the perimeters and not engaging in the work. More important, they wanted to know if McNamara had finally been convinced to sign the Shaker covenant, which would formally bind his deed of consecration of his lands to the Shakers and they had now built their village on these very lands. Now this woman here is McNamara's uh, eldest daughter, Vincy McNamara. She became the instrument for mother Ann Lee. So this is the founder of the Shakers I mentioned who had died in 1784. And so she is now speaking as mother Ann and Free Gift Wells sends her directly to her father to negotiate the surrender of his journals and papers and his signature of the covenant. And he refuses her. Now, the Shakers began to get increasingly violent with their rhetoric. Um, Mother Anne would bring swords. This man here, Oliver Hampton, uh, came to meeting on December 23rd of 1838 and ominously announced that Mother had given him a gun 
and that they might all find a benefit with such weapons and enough to do. So this is not a real gun, but this is a spiritual gun. So we don't think of the shakers wielding weapons against each other in, in their meetings, but they were. Another sister brought a gun that could be turned by a crank. She first thought it was a musical instrument, but then it went off in her hands and it scared her. However, she soon learned to handle her gun very dexterously. She used it to shoot at monsters. She said it gave a dreadful bang when she shot, and no doubt it did, for it would stun and jar and cramp her through the breast and shoulders most distressingly when she had in a heavy load. She would plead with mother to load her gun light. Oh, mother, if you do put in one of your heavy bullets, it would kill. So this is, if you don't believe it, this elaborate pantomime of violence happening among the Shakers at Union Village. Now, people began to get nervous about the legitimacy of these spiritual gifts. This woman here, Sister Susanna Little, was a small girl uh, or a teenage girl of 15 and witnessed the first visionary state of a newly arrived Irish woman, Margaret McBrien. This woman had come from Ireland. She had given birth to a son at sea and arrived as a single woman at Union Village late in 1838. She almost immediately took on the voice of Mother Anne, supplanting McNamara's own daughter, Vincy, as the highest ranked spirit medium in the society. Little described, it was in a society meeting that while, while we were in the march that this young Irish woman called Margaret McBrien left her place in the circle and turning very swiftly amid the aisle. This broke up the exercise of the meeting and we took our seats around the wall of the room, watching the great turning swiftness of the wonderful operation. This would be one of the meeting rooms where the Shakers worshiped at Union Village. McBrien brought her visionary gifts to bear immediately for a free gift to Wallace the minister and essentially served as his guide because he had ceded his own ministerial authority to her because she had claimed that of Mother Ann Lee and there was no higher authority within the Shakers. So Richard McNamara, because of his reluctance, began receiving personal messages directly from the spirits. Mother Ann, through Mar Margaret McBrien, told him that the reputed crime of self-righteousness was repeatedly expressed by the visionists. Mother said that McNamara was, quote, covered over with such a thick coat of self-righteousness that there is nothing anyone can do with him. By March 26th, McNamara was stripped of his pseudonym of Eliezer Wright, which was, um, a, a, you know, one of the things that was most important to him as it recognized his role in the community. By uh, the end of March of 1838, McNamara himself was finally warned in meeting that his gift among the Shakers was up and he was told to put off the ground immediately. He had forfeited his union among believers uh, and unless he would confess his sins that he had to leave immediately. Well, he said he had no sins to confess. The mother told him that he was ministering poison to the believers and he must go immediately. So he started to go back to his old house to give him a lot of time um, that he had given to the Shakers as a 69 year old man moving wheelbarrow loads of possessions throughout the day. At the end of the day, two brothers went with the wagon and brought it all back. He later went to New York to plead his case to the Eastern Ministry in the New Lebanon Meeting House. And they gave him a spirit message which told him that he had had, uh, it is the lamb that overcometh. The lion, which was Richard, must eat straw like the ox and a little child shall lead them. Brother Eliezer has had much of the lion in his spirit, but now he must come down and be like the lamb. So his health was destroyed by this time. And although he was given redemption by the Eastern Shakers, he returned to Ohio and within about a week, he had died. And so there was Mother Ann Lee a drawing of her whose spirit had castigated McNamara in Ohio, but then gave him redemption in New Lebanon. So uh, after he returned to New Lebanon in August 1839, within a week, he found a permanent home family in the graveyard there at Union Village. So that's a nutshell version of a very long and rich life uh, that had a tragic end, which if you're curious about it, you could read my book. Sponsored by the Program for the Evolution of Spirituality. Copyright 2023, President and Fellows of Harvard College.